Throwing like a frog or a gerbil in between there, but whatever, I'm no cosmopolitan. Anyway, <laughs> Just that fact. Hi, I'm Tyler Folsom, a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Today we're going to be looking at another one of the hilarious Sam O'Nellis videos called Animals in Space, A Brief History. Let's check it out. Hey kids, animal test subjects have always been an important facet of science since they allow us to study <laughs> physiology in more destructive ways than we could get away with on humans. Wow. So it should come as no surprise that, over the years, there's been a lot of creatures that have been thrown at the cosmos against their will. Here's a bunch of smelly animals that achieve more in their short lives than you ever will. Quick disclaimer, this is by no means a comprehensive sure. list, not even close, we'd be here all day if it was. More so just a highlight reel of the ones I found the most interesting. So the Great Zoo in the Sky was first found in 1947 when the U.S. launched a craft containing a bunch of fruit flies 68 miles into the air in order to see... I had no idea it was that early. ...mutants would get made from all the cosmic radiation. <laughs> so, obviously he's making a joke about bizarre mutations, but the radiation in space is significant and varies a lot. According to NASA, it is between 50 and 2,000 millisieverts, which is basically like getting between 150 and 6,000 chest x-rays for going up into space. A part of it depends on solar activity um, and how long you actually do it. Um, it's directly proportional to your stay time in space. But that is a lot. Um, nuclear engineers and other radiation workers, the annual dose limit is 50 millisieverts. So they're getting a lot more dose than we were supposed to get working at a nuclear power plant. And keep in mind, I never got that much. And even people who had to go towards some of the, the hottest jobs, um, I don't know anyone who got anywhere near 50 millisieverts. So astronauts... I'm sorry, but that, that same requirement must not apply to you guys. So yeah, the dose is, is crazy. Um, one of the things we take for granted is um, an atmosphere, uh, strong magnetic fields to protect us from cosmic radiation. They're even saying that a civilization looking to have life on Mars, if we were to do that, we're going to want to start underground just because of the additional shielding to protect us from radiation since Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere or magnetic field. Let's continue. Unfortunately, they were totally fine. So the Earth was like, hey, living things can go into space and not die instantly. Supple. And the next year, they decided to send up a rhesus macaque named Albert. Which, it seems kind of like jumping the gun to go from barely alive specks to basically a person in one step. If it were me, I would have thrown like a frog or a gerbil in between there, but whatever, I'm no cosmopolitan. <laughs> Anyway, Albert died of suffocation on the way up and never really made it to space alive. Fun mm -hmm. fact, this rocket was actually a V-2 missile stolen That's from what it looked like. Too. Huh. So just in case any of you have any sympathy for those Nazi characters, they're technically responsible for the death of a poor innocent space monkey. Another reason to not like the Nazis. But I guess the US felt pretty bad about it, so they decided to deal with their grief by naming the next monkey Albert II. Pretty unhealthy coping mechanism according to my shrink. <laughs> Also thinks punk is dead, so what does she know? This Albert actually made it into space alive through a grand effort incorporating all the incredible cutting edge technology that the Atomic Era had to offer. And after all that, they goofed on the parachute, so Albert II turned mm -hmm. into a fine red mist on impact. Which just goes wow. to prove the age old adage, you can lead a monkey to space, but you can't make him land. There were a few more Alberts <laughs> after this. Albert 3 fucking exploded, wow. Albert 4 made it up, but he had another tissue paper parachute what don't work for heck, so he's out. Albert 5, yet again, bad shoot, liquefied on impact, until finally, in 1951, on Albert number 6, they figured out how to make a big blanket that consistently makes you not immediately die when you fall from the sky. <laughs> and the monkey was recovered alive from the capsule, alongside his 11 mouse roommates. Of course, he died two hours later, but hey, still counts. Earlier that same wow. year, Russia launched two little pupniks named Tsigan and Tzizik, <laughs> both of whom came back unharmed. These two were the first vertebrates to ever leave Earth and come back alive. Then in 57, the Reds snagged another achievement by putting the first living thing into orbit. Besides the bacteria clinging to Sputnik, mm. they're losers, we don't talk about them. Specifically, they launched one brave and daring dog from the streets of Moscow, probably the most famous animal to ever go into space. You know its name well. 
That dog is, of course, Airbud. <laughs> Like it was never planned to be recovered intact since Air we bar. barely knew how to put something into orbit by this time, let alone bring it back. But they still wanted to make sure she stayed alive long enough to at least reach space. So before the mission, they put her through the most rigorous canine space camp that Russia had to offer, throwing her in a centrifuge for a while to get her used to G-force, making her cage progressively smaller to get her used to cramped spaces, which made her just not shit anymore at all, but that's the wow. story. They also switched her diet to a special high-nutrition gel that she would have eaten after takeoff, you know, had her brain not crapped out from overheating within the first few hours. In 59, the U.S. strapped two monkeys to the nose cone of a Jupiter missile and actually got them back alive afterwards, which is crazy mostly because the these things withstood 38 G's of acceleration. For wow. Context, that's the force that makes even trained pilots lose consciousness times four, or this thing times 12, <laughs> or roughly the same forced experience when you realize that's not a normal speed bump, but one of those evil tiny ones that ruin your life. You know the ones. <laughs> well, that's what you get for doing 25 near a hospital, Sam. Well, hey, good thing I'm already here considering the ballistics test that just went down between the roof of my car and my frickin' skull. Jesus. <laughs> so in 61, we graduated from monkeys to great apes, sending up a chimpanzee great named apes. Ham. Remember Space Chimps? Yeah, it was that. Frame for frame. Andy Samberg and all. What's special about <laughs> Ham is that he was actually trained to pull levers and slap buttons while up in the ship, being rewarded banana pellets for completing tasks and getting his feet tased whenever he messed up. Sounds and that is proof right there that a monkey can operate a nuclear power plant. Not really, but sure. A cartoon, I know, but I promise it's for real. Meanwhile, the Sweets were busy putting a big, bald, smart ape into orbit. <laughs> orbit deal. Smart ape. I saw the U.S. and Russia sending up monkeys and dogs and felt left out, so in 63, they launched a cat- Of course, he's got a beret. Yeah, that's cool and unique. I'm one of the popular kids now. In 68, the Soviets saw the rabbit making rice cakes on the moon and said, hmm, how about a tortoise for that hair? Launching two of them into deep space, all the way around the moon and back to Earth, where they were recovered alive after their capsule landed in the ocean. Kind of cheating when you are your own crash suit, but an impressive feat regardless. <laughs> In 73, we put mummy chogs in space. What's a mummy chog? It's one of these things. Like a fish, but real rough and tumble. Tolerates low oxygen, weird- I never knew about fish. Dishwasher safe, energy star rated, you name it, sister. Wow. At first they could only swim in circles, but after a couple weeks, they actually adapted to zero-g and figured out how to maneuver properly. Even more interesting, we also brought mummy chog eggs. And when these hatched, the little mummy choglets knew how to swim in zero-g immediately. Kind of spooky. Space-born aliens. Sent up some spiders who managed to spin some webs. Trash webs, mind you, but Hey, they managed. Huh. In 78, The Muppet Show aired Pigs in Space for the first time. In 85, they cut off the arms of a bunch of newts and sent them off to see if they grow back. Wow. The, the reasoning behind this being, if a newt can't grow stuff back, then an astronaut with a paper cut probably can't either. Fortunately, they rearmed themselves at the normal rate, so all's good on that front. You wonder about those creatures now. Granted, it's creatures that small are, are going to be less affected by gravity, but... Like, people that are born in space, well, first off, can people even have kids in space? And we like for them to come to Earth if they're used to that zero-G environment. They're going to have to wear an Earth suit. At the same time, oh, NASA that is terrifying. Sesame Street about sending Big Bird well, up on the space shuttle as a publicity stunt. This is real. It's hard to look at. Ultimately, fell through after they realized Big Bird is fucking giant and unwieldy at all times. Literally the worst possible choice for a celebrity cameo on a space. No. Shuttle. So instead, they sent a school teacher in his place. And then the Challenger fucking exploded. Uh. Let me reiterate. There is a timeline not too far from this one where Big Bird is a casualty in the single worst astronautical disaster in history. A tiny that's, little that's wild. Who almost wishes that happened? Like, that's just so indescribably absurd. In the early 90s, we set up some baby jellyfish to grow up in space just for laughs. They figured out how to maneuver just fine, but when we brought them back down, they literally didn't have a concept of gravity and couldn't orient themselves properly in their new environment. I guess that, that's the point right there. So we did that experiment with jellyfish. Yeah, that, that would be hard. Gotta get those Earth suits if we're gonna have kids in space. Being a jellyfish is the easiest thing there is. You just kind of exist, maybe squirm a little now and then. So when you manage to somehow mess that up, you know things have gone seriously wrong. Yeah. In 2003, the U.S. sent up a bunch of... 2003? Including silkworms, spiders, carpenter bees, and harvester ants. Whoops, they exploded. Yeah. In 2007, some tardigrades went up, Columbia. totally exposed to the vacuum of space for 10 days, which, surprise, surprise, they were fine. On that same mission, a cockroach gave birth, creating the first organism that we know of to ever have been conceived outside of Earth. Conceived, finally, too. Interesting. In 2018... Elon Musk sent a big basket of mice to the International Space Station. 
just you know because he can so there's <laughs> a handful of guys elon musk you got to experience the majesty of not knowing up from down if you're like me you're probably a little jealous why does an ugly <laughs> get to go into space but i don't i wish to bear witness to the music of the spheres firsthand in a way that a lower creature could never appreciate that's a trip you, know, you feel like that because you're a nerd and what i am a nerd i love sam O'Nello's stuff i always learn these really obscure things that's that's like his thing Never knew about the the fish or cockroaches or or that jellyfish experiment. I guess that just went ahead and answered my question. That's awesome. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.